So why type erasure? Because I asked what topic I should present. I took a mouthful, right? And I was lecturing, and they said, oh, well, talk about type erasure. And I said, okay, I can do this. And then it, took, it turned out I need to do some research to prepare something useful, hopefully, for you. So, but uh, do we actually need type erasure? And when I look at some Ruby code, then obviously we don't need it. It just works, right? So we have here uh, values. We can put in strings and whatever. Now my mouse pointer. We can put in numbers, integer, strings, double values, and we can join them and it prints out and it will just work. And when we just collect the numbers, it will also just work. So it seems to work. So why type erasure? Anyone an idea? No idea at all. It has to be agnostic. Oh. Uh, it's convenient. It's convenient, right? But why do we need to do something special? In well, I, I give the answer. Because this talk is not about Ruby or Python. It's about C++. And we have a compiler. And the compiler cares a lot about types, right? And we cannot put things of different size and different types in an array of continuous memory because the compiler will say, I don't know about this, right? I don't know what to do. So we need to satisfy our Grant the compiler. And this is why we have type erasure in C. Thanks for listening. <laughs> well, I mean, this is not so far from reality. Um, I guess some of you might know this. Who knows this? Hands up. Who knows this? Actually, nearly everyone, right? So this is from the, the, the only gener generic part from the C standard library. Um, it has an approved version since C. And I think I will give up this mouse soon because. So it, it does obviously. This point should move, but it doesn't. We have the. Uh, In C++11, we have, here we take uh, a pointer to hopefully an array. We take the, how many elements are in this and, and the size of the elements. And then we take a sort function, which takes two void pointers and the third void point, point, point pointer. And the third void pointer is this void pointer, which is the context where you can pass in something like uh, which language are you dealing with. And I mean, anyone sees a problem with this? I hope you see some problems, potential problems. We solve the front time. Exactly, right? So you write stuff, and if it's not correct, it's at runtime you have something, and maybe it's too late when you, when you notice it. So this is one of the reasons why we use C++. We have more type information. I just tried to, to refresh the page to get this point now away. So, we, <coughs> sorry for this, but ah, okay, this works much better. I will do it like this. Then I don't see the next slide, so I have to turn around. So sorry. Uh, we see plus plus. We have more type information, so we can get things at at compile them. The compiler will tell us if something is not correct, and runtime. We can also return error code for those people that don't like exception handling. And since C17, we have no discharge as, as this keyword, which until then basically static analysis did, which say, hey, you are, don't care about this uh, return value. And this is when you can see brackets void <laughs> from some people. But at least we have the possibility to, to use it and say, please care about this return value. It's something meaningful in this function. So, and this is what I'm going to cover this evening. Uh, container algorithm in, in template meta programming because it's some kind of, of type erasure. Everything as object oriented programming. 
as to the n, as to the function variance, and some other details. Um, I have here page numbers. I hope you can, can read them. I have some points where you can ask questions. If they become too long, I will uh, delegate them to the end and please don't uh, write down the page numbers where you have the questions too. So, all codes I show compiles, but it's optimized for slides where so that it fits on on the screen. So it's it's not like you would read it properly in, uh, in production code. Hmm? So SDL container and algorithms. Um, this is the sort function we use in C++, right? And you can use it with any type that has implemented the correct uh, comparison operators, of course. And we can also pass in a, a, a sort function, our own sort function. So here we take the standards uh, greater to get it uh, in the different order, but we can throw in any function. And we have type security. So if, if you would do this with the C version, you start with, with float and then say, oh, we need more positions, and you change to double, and your comparison function still float, will hopefully you find it correct. But here we will get a compiler error. And it doesn't look that nice, this compiler error, <laughs> but you might see here today we live in luxury. Here is already something red. So since Gang, the, the message has become much better. And it's at, at least we, we know where to, to start to look. And in case you see Gang, you look top down. And from which we just do the, you look in the other directions. So we live already very luxury. But this is a little bit of a downside. But the good thing is this happens before runtime. Right? So we don't have a wrong function in production, and I love this. And you get used to compiler messages like this somehow. So and this is why I said this is some kind of static polymorphism or, or type erasure, right? So uh, a template, if you give a type in and it fulfills what the implementation of the template expects, then it, it compiles and will do the thing. And if not, you get, we get com, uh, compiler error. Mm -hmm. So I think there were, is, are there any questions to campus already? No. So we could go fast over the, the, the runtime polymorphism, so everything object. Uh, keywords to, to object oriented programming, I mean, uh, common base class, abstract interfaces, virtual function, functions overwriting. So this is uh, nothing very surprising. And this is the canonical widget example, where we have a widget. <coughs> and then a circle in the box, which generates from the widget. The widget has a abstract function draw. We implement the draw method. And at runtime, we, we have added a position for this. And at runtime, we have a draw method. And the draw method don't care about the actual real type, right? It says it needs to be some kind of widget I can draw. And this is known since ever. And we can apply it. And we can also put things of the same base type into a collection. So when I, when I collect screen elements, and, and I say I want to have the position into which it's stored somewhere, then I can put this into a vector. And I can put have the subs, uh, different things in a vector as long as it is implements a widget. Right, so I can add a, a cycle in the box to the same vector, and then I can draw everything. So this is not very surprising, as I think. But there are some drawbacks, which some people have a problem with. This is heap allocation. Everything needs to be a heap allocation. If you want to put it on the same things, otherwise not. We have indirections for um, through a V table. We have usually, if we look at object oriented programming, this value semantic is gone which we, a lot of people love in C++. And some people have also a problem with runtime type information, dynamic cast, right, because it's adds additional overhead. And if you ask the embedded world, they will say no. <laughs> and yeah, there's a lot of things we could talk about. Um, but this is also why the topic continues, right, because otherwise we would be done. 
So now I come to the first, which which um, uh, really type operation things. And the first things I could think about this is any. And there is boost any, which exists since, for me, nearly since ever, because this is about the time where we started with C++. And the, the, the example for any, which was we equate the vector with any and call it many, you can push back whatever you want, strings, integer float, what type, as long as it's copyable. And this is the same implementation from the Ruby example. Um, Various uh, from algorithm accumulate. I go over from the beginning of, of many to the end. I have an initial value of zero, and I add a lambda. This takes the init value and the actual value of the element. I can ask which type is in this any. If it's the type I expect, I can add it to the accumulator. And if not, they do nothing. And so I can use it. And any is since uh, C17 in the standard. So, wow, this is great, right? But how does it actually work? Well, it hides some, the original implementation and also today, it hides some dirty secrets. And we, we will have a look at them. So we take a a base class and call it placeholder. Um, we need a clone method because otherwise we cannot copy things. Right? Object oriented programming clone is, is, is. We will also see how it works then. We, we, we carry the type info with us because we need it to restore whatever is in our any. And that's it. And that is our placeholder. And then we have a holder that actually holds the value we want to store. And this has actually here the the value. And it takes a, this is a template function, so it can be any value. It implements the base holder. And it returns the type information. And it knows how to clone stuff. It creates a new value actually on the heap, right? So this is the internal uh, secret. And then, of course, uh, you need uh, constructors. And you need, for, you need your any, you need the constructor, and you need to, to have a pointer to the placeholder, because you don't know what's in it, right? You don't care. You throw the, the rest away. And then we need to get this information, which is also a template function. This is why I have get, which type do I want. And we just check if this type the user gives us is the stored type, which is in there. And if it is, we can cast it and return it. And if not, we return a null pointer. And then there's a little bit of a richer interface for any. But this is all, it works like, like in this principle. So we, we store the type information, which gives us the compiler. Actually, it's a compile time value. And so we can restore it. And then, of course, we need the constructor, copy constructor assignments. Since C11 also move. And so on. And now we have this 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 any value which it becomes a value type. So because under the hood this is implemented for us, right? As long as we have a value type, we can use it, and we can push these things into a vector, and we can also copy it around, and it will behave like we expected, like any type. Mm -hmm. So this is very flexible. You can use it with what, whatever you want, as long as it's a copyable type. And it's value semantic. So for us, it looks natural when we use value semantic. But we might have heap allocation. So today, we may be in the, in the standard library. And it's maybe way too flexible, because normally you don't want to store whatever you want, right? But this is any. Do we have any questions so far? Oh, yeah. yeah? <clears throat> Why do you need the type info object? To get the type out because... Yes, but can't you do that 
directly by using a dynamic cast. You have a unique pointer dot get, and then you do a dynamic cast. Yes, but then I need to, to compile with runtime type information that I have this dynamic cast. But with this, I can turn it off and, and say compiler don't compile with RTTI and dynamic cast, and it will work, right? And it's also because it's a compile time value, it's existed compile time. It's, it's a little bit better. But uh, if you say, if you would go the whole way object oriented and then you could, of, of course, always say, create the, the, the actual holder type from the type and say, can I convert it, right? Mm -hmm. It's just the implementation detail. As I said, you, you need more compi uh, less compiler flags in first for C. You need, but some people turn it off, right? Other question to any? No? Okay, then we continue. So any of a, of a something. So let's consider this example. Well, this is what we know from any, where we have the placeholder and the holder. And I change this. I say we have a widget, co widget concept. And the widget concept, I expect there is a draw. Right? And a clone. And then say, I have a widget holder, which holds anything at long, as long as it has a draw method. Right? So here, because we call widget draw on the position. <coughs> and then, of course, the, the clone method as used. But so it's, it's, it's actually basically the same. And here we hold the, the, the actual widget. So we can hold anything that fulfills our concept that is say we have a draw method. So this way when I have, uh, I just have this, this as, a, as we add elements to the scene and I have my scene elements, I need to make the scene elements copyable because now we're in the world of uh, copy semantic, right? So I have, the implementation detail, but when we copy the vector from a scene to another scene, the vector elements will be copied and have these vector elements. So this is just uh, for the slide where this, so something needs to be copied. But now we can add the scene to a scene. It just needs to fulfill the concept of draw. And I implement this, and then in this example, I, I, I imagine that our position object has a blast operator, so it can remove the another position and it will fulfill the concept and then I can add the scene into a scene mm -hmm. and this is pretty nice and this is very flexible we build only this object oriented where we use it actually where we say I have this vector where we have where I have this virtual interface with the draw method no one else so if I want to be drawable, I don't need to implement it, and maybe 20 other methods that someone put in this base class and I don't care about, right? And, yeah, we have quite a semantic end. And we have still heap allocation and Gion and the interaction, but, and we need to implement the base concept, right? But this is pretty nice. Are there any questions to this, or is this clear to everyone? Right? Seems to be yeah. Nice. I will be way too early done if you don't ask questions. <laughs> so, but maybe we can do something. So, unifying draws. So, if all this example, we just wanted to draw something. It's just one function, right? What we do. So, if it's just one function, and say we have something given like this one. I would say we have from an external library, and this is an artist library, it paints. And we draw, and it has a position of an array with two elements, and we have our position struct. Then we can use std function, right? And we can put things into the std functions, and the implementation, the actual function that we call, we care about that the right co code is called. And when we call the std function, we don't know what's in the function, right? So we don't know, care about the type anymore. What we need is the, the constructor to, to create this kind of functions. So here I, 
I, I draw this uh, paintable. So I take the position we have and translate it to the position the external library wants to have. And I make this uh, call to a full object, right? And uh, I've decided here to, to store the position in the function by capturing it. And then we have the, our bar object or whatever. So we capture the position and we draw it with, as it is, right? And then we can have it like this, right? We have a vector where we have our call function, std functions, and we put in whatever we want from this constructor, and then we, we just draw it. We do, here, we don't know actually what's, what's, what we're drawing, so that's uh, it's kind of at this moment. Hmm? Easy to use and implement. Um, we can adapt things, we can rename things, put things together. We have also value semantic for FSTD functions when you capture correct things. Still no readable. Uh, but this we have, it's just one function interface, right? And it might also allocate, and some people have a problem with this. Right? Any questions to the function implementation? Maybe a hand? Yeah. How do you store a lambda in the function? I know it works, but. Yes, it, you, you just put it in. Yeah, so but <coughs> you were talking about the implementation details of any, but we didn't say how the function. Well, actually, we, we, we do. Here's two lambda in the function. So I have here the std function. That's a draw call. And here I return a draw call. Yeah, I, I know how it works. You didn't say how the std function internally is, is made. You were talking about how the any is made. OK, made. yeah. This is, um, we will come to a, to a part of it, right? <laughs> um, STD function is a very complex implementation, and this would be our own talk, mm -hmm. and I haven't researched it in that depth, to be, to be yeah. honest, but we will, we will strive it a little bit. So, because this, this uh, STD function does internal type erasure. So this type erasure, type erasure, what we do here, and this is why STD function might allocate if you have a capture value, and it, if it goes over a certain size, and we will come to this detail mm -hmm. in a moment. Yes? Um, the std function can also be used to, if you only want the void function here, you're forcing the user to only store void functions in there. If you were to add some parameters, you can specify what type the lambda should return, and everything. And you that's very useful. Exactly. Well, I, I, I define uh, this. Lambda doesn't tell you that. You can then, with this force, instance, an API to add some values. Lambda itself is already something. There are lambdas that, that, that we'll we see it later, that just converts to a function pointer. And this lambda, since it's capture object, it creates something like a struct with the operator brackets, and we'll have a member variable. And this as the function is, hides this internal from so it's type origin type. Huh? This is but this is why I have it. Something about the STD function? But I see a, a, a topic. So when someone wants to do a lightning talk, this is researched and presented. It's cool. Maybe I will do it. Might allocate, so we will have a look now at this. Because I mentioned it now a little bit that this might be a problem. So let's think back to our any. And let's say we have our unique point of the placeholder, but we add now a union. Where we say we take a pointer or something that has the same size. Yeah. And then I define my max buffer size. I can implementation detail what, what do I want, right? And I store the fact if we are on the heap or not. Because I need this to have at runtime this information. And when we use this, I use here this, this modern if cost expression with compiler because it's the easiest, nicest way. 
So if the size of what we want to store in our any goes over the size we define for our max buffer, which is the pointer size, we put this in our pointer variable and we create it on the heap. If not, we take placement new. And new takes the argument, which is take this storage. And then the storage will be on the stack. And then we have either, if, if, we, if, we, if we say we want our any and store a Boolean or an integer, it makes no sense to create the heap for a pool or integer. But we need also to have uh, enough size for if this is a struct with just one character, there might be padding, so this is why we have the alignment was the cap. And then we, 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 we need to, in some places, if heap. Uh, also for the cleanup, we will have a nice example a little bit later. So this is something, yeah, in the, in the get code, we also have, the, if we use the heap, then we, what we had, if not, we just reinterpret cast to the type the user exists and which is checked that it's the correct type, we just say, hey, here is what we have in memory for you. Hmm? So this is the small buffer optimization that STD function also doesn't tolerate. And it allows us to scale, actually. I can say, okay, I don't want to, to have my whatever we store things bigger as the pointer size, but I could also say, hey, I take up to I don't know, 24, 16. <clears throat> and then we have some if heap on some places. And then we can scale. Or, uh, of course, as I showed you with the storage, I could also say if you're bigger than the storage and you want to be in this any, I don't compile. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's actually super flexible and we have full, full power and full control. And we scale either heap or memory. Hmm? Any questions to this? No? I take this as a compliment that I explain it good, right? <laughs> okay, selection of a set of types. So we have seen a union, and this is a classical union. And this will be, for most of you, not super surprising. If I put this and subtract the class and call it variant. And I feel to remember the type. And I do a lot of writing, which types I can put in here. And in, in, in plain words, data is not that many, but it can be many. Then I can put into this union whatever I want. Of course, to the price of, of the, the biggest element in the, in the variant will define. But this is, we know this, right? It's not a surprise. And when we get the stuff, yeah, it's, it's how do we want to design the interface? Do we want to return if the type is correct? Do we want to throw? This is implementation detail of libraries. This is a generic solution. And yeah, it's a lot of handwriting. But this should not, but it's also some kind of, of type erasure. And when we use it, yeah, it's like a variant type. And there was a change in C++11 that we cannot just bring out data types, we can also have the complex types. So with, with a, a constructor and a destructor, we can, uh, if we use something like a string or our own object with a constructor, we, we, we need to implement a constructor and a destructor. And it works like we have already seen before, placement new. So if I say I put the string into this, I need to store it here. And then I need to, when I want to get rid of this value, I need to manually call the destructor. Because as the string internal does something, maybe a heap allocation or not. You know how it works, right? Small buffer optimization. But we need to call the destructor and we take care about this. And this is one of the few things where I call a destructor manually in the code. Otherwise, we would have resource leaks. Maybe you should explain 
Uh, plain old data, they are simple data, it's just memcopy data, which, which does nothing, right? The string does something and, and, and copy it, allocates. So, yeah. Okay. Are you sure you cannot avoid calling the destructor menu? No. I mean, you cannot do it, but then you will have a resource leak. Because if it is this small string wouldn't matter because it's a small string optimization, but if I would have a longer string, the string would allocate, and we need to call a destructor. And if I store something else in this variant, the destructor of the variant, this destructor, will not know that they have to clean up if there is a string in there. So in this, this destructor, we need to actually implement if the current type, what is stored, is a string, I need to clean up. So the destructor need to know it. Hmm? I let this settle some moments. If... Yes. Yeah. If you can go back to the slide where when you had the get function. This one. Yes. Uh, when you try to get something, uh, can't you just uh, return a type of union and uh, put inside the of course, yes. I could also return an optional. It's a set implementation detail how we implement yeah, this. But then we don't have to rewrite the get function, I guess, no? We can just write one function and... You mean I delegate the problem to the user? <laughs> here, here is a variant and the type, make it your own. Yes, of course. Yeah. yeah, but someone needs to write it if you want to do something with this data, right? If you just... So you mean instead of calling the destructor yourself, you can add it to the destructor of the variant? And no, you must, the... yes, you must. So if we, if we use the variant as a value object, we need to implement the copy constructor with the hand, and I need to go there and say, if I am a text, then I need to copy the text to the other variant, and if I move it, I need to say, hey, you, I move the string to the other, don't clean up. And if I go out of scope, I need to say, if I hold the text, then I need to, to, to call the destructor of this. Mm -hmm. So we, it's a lot of, 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 of handwriting stuff. Hmm? The new uh, ampersand data text, etc. Couldn't you just say data.text equals uh, value? No, because it needs uh, placement new. Okay. This is how C++ is. Uh, this. this uh, <coughs> Yeah. Because if you already have <coughs> an integer in the variant, if you would just assign to text, it would assume that the variant contained a valid string that you can destroy before doing the assignment. Uh, but if the variant contains some other data type, uh, yeah. you do not have a valid string object. So. Thanks for this. Hmm? More to this? We can any time come back to it. So this is some kind of type erasure, right? Mm. We can avoid heap allocation, exactly the, except the type that does it, but then we don't care, right? Value semantic, but it's, it's as I said, it's a little bit tedious to implement. It's not the nicest thing. I have a question, and pardon me if it's just confusing, but let's say we have a container of a large, or some, some reference or some heap allocated large object. Can the compiler pre cache that then? If we have, this is a non erased container. So we have some, uh, let's say, a vector to a large object, large objects on the heap, and mm -hmm. we want to iterate through it. Mm -hmm. Can the compiler pre cache that if it's Clever no, because we don't know when if it's on the heap, it's somewhere right to get okay. some memory at runtime. Okay. Yeah, so then the other question also. But the other no. question was if the type ratio will mess up caching, if the compiler will cache in the non erased case. No, because uh, I mean, this will not mess up the stuff because the compiler will actually say what is the biggest thing, and this, I think this. Ah, it was this, not this way, it was the, the previous part. It, this is the same for this way, right? You put something in and to say, well, I mean, it's like like strings, right? If you have a lot of small strings, 
Then they will be in the string where there is the, the length and it's in the pointer values, right? So it will be small buffer allocation. ABC will be there and it will not point on the heap. And if you have a lot of small string, then you can go through them and they will be faster than C strings because they allocate, right? But if there is a long string, then you come, okay, here's the pointer. Okay, I need to go to this other location, right? And this, is, this doesn't change anything in this. Hmm? Okay. So with C plus plus seventeen we get variant, which is why nice it's a type safe union and it does actually what we want. So I can declare a variant with whatever types I want. And I have no boilerplate to implement my own. Someone library implementator did it already for me. Mm. If I try to get the wrong thing out of it, it will throw. So the interface decision has also been done for us. So what happened if I put in things and I get the thing? I will get it. And it, uh, there is a richer interface in STD variant. Get if will it tell you, give you a null pointer if it's not the type we expect. So, and this is this is actually very nice. Um, because it's basically what we have is the union, but we don't need to write it. And this is some kind of type erasure because we put something in and then it's there. Don't care. Um, someone could do their own talk about this with visitors and so on. You're welcome to do it. Um, it's type safe if they want to get something that is not in this variant. Uh, the compiler will say, hey, you, you want a foo, but there is no foo in this. It's runtime check that it has value semantics, so as the variant is not allowed to, to, to heap, uh, heap allocations. Hmm? So this is nice. So how would the internal implementation look of a variant? I need my storage. And I take my line storage, and I need a list of types. So this is the variable template. And I get the biggest size. This defines the size of the storage. So the biggest element in the collection of types that says, this is your size. Mm. We do a little bit of bookkeeping and remember the type. And we have now also a hash code, which is a little bit nicer. And we have some, I've put it here into a function for, for slides. We need to maybe clean up something, right? Told about the, the destructors. So if we have something to clean up, then we need to clean up. No surprises with this. And when we look how we put something in, we check that it is a type I specified in the type list for the, for the type. And this junction is in the standard library. It tells me it's, a, it's, a, it's basically an or with all the other things. So is, is it the same type of one I specified before from a storage type I put in here? And then I take the, the arguments, whatever, I need to construct this type, right? So I, I check already, is it, is it the type you specified if you want to store something in there? And if not, we have static assert now, and we can make somehow nice uh, error messages. So the, I can put some, some usable information. It will still be like whatever, and it will a little bit down the, down the stack, but it's good, right? <coughs> yes. And if I have something I need to clean up, we have already seen this. We place the, the data I forward all this argument for this, whatever it is I need to construct here. And the cleanup function <coughs> is I need to call the destructor of this. And since this is a template argument, also all the sudden also the compiler will not say, hey, integer doesn't have a destructor, right? <laughs> because this is this is in the standard. But when it's a template argument, you can say it has a destructor even if not. And we take the type ID, the new type ID, which we could also put some 
it's, it's basically a, a, a integer type. Size thing, I guess. Yeah. Hmm? And when we get, we just check if the type the user wants to have is the stored type, and then we turn it. And if not, uh, if we have a slider, I return a null pointer because we did the previous examples also. Mm -hmm. And the real variant is a much more richer interface with you can write visitors and. Well, some that if couldn't that be const expert? Maybe. No, because this is a runtime decision. Oh, okay. This does the user at, at, at runtime. We don't know we have so no way the type information. Mm. We don't know. We need to check it when it's accessed. Mm? And yeah, we fool on the bar. And yeah, this is just my, my desk code to, to test the code. So we get various semantic out of the box with this. And then, of course, we need to implement a full interface for, for variants. Luckily, some people have done it. If you are an older compiler, there are several uh, MPAX. He's the author of some of these bugs. MPAX variants, then you get something. And there is also no STD variant, which has a reduced interface. So if you are a stick of the old compiler, you can find such library in the net and already use it. So this is very nice. Hmm? Of course, nothing comes for free. Right? The, the price for avoiding heap allocation is just maybe you, you use more memory as you would have to use. But we know this. And we can, if we, we do our own implementation, we can, as I said before, we can do variations of it. We can, we can say it's a variant up to the size of whatever, if you're an embedded device. Because then I would say, hey, please don't give me your monster objects. Hmm? And we can check this, of course, of that compile time because the size of something is known at compile time. And we can say to the user, hey, sorry, this is too big for, for my library. Do your own stuff. Hmm? OK. Any questions still to the variant type now? We will have a slightly variation of this soon. So that's another interesting question. If I put something like in the variant, right? But I say it should be drawable. How could I do this? Because this is actually also a very interesting question. This has also use cases. So when I when I don't know the type anymore, right? Mm -hmm. So we need some some kind of of, of V table. Because when we do the classic object oriented, there is some kind of read table and it says, okay, this is this type and this is this function, so I point to this function when I call draw. So we need something similar. And we can create this, right? And here we take function pointers. And for this example, I just have the draw method and uh, the destructor of something. Mm -hmm. So they can the object, and when I get the object, I uh, will wire this on this object I know, and then I will call one of these. We'll see this in a moment. So when I create something, I get that here as the first some memory where I say, OK, this is a drawable. Right? I draw it in a position. And when I get something, I have to know this needs to fit. We need to ensure at compile time that this is, doesn't mess it up, because otherwise it will be. <laughs> and so we call it a structure. But we can ensure this at compile time that this works. And here I, I, I take lambdas, which I convert to plain function pointer, because there, are, there is no state. This is why I want the first argument as a void star. So void star is still here. Mm -hmm. And then I have a drawable with, with the storage. 
or as a box and circle, whatever. And when I draw it, whatever, in the data, I call it the store, the watch store. And it will go with this function pointer to the right type, cast whatever is in the store to the right type and call the draw method from this object that is in the store. And the same with the destructor. When we go out of scope, we will say, OK, here is your chunk of memory. You know the type, you know what to do, call it. Mm -hmm. We will see later example in the whole and it will become a little bit easier to follow. So for this example, I've, I have decided to, to put the constructor into the add method of the, because it fits better on the slide. So I have my, my still my element. This, this, uh, now I have drawables, what I had before. And when we place something back, I tell it the V table and I'm sure that they have the same type. Right? So I create it, I store it, like with the place function we've seen before. And I create the V table. And the V table will point to the functions of whatever I can place here. Of the type. Hmm? Then I can use this already. So this is for sure not the easiest thing to, to get the first time you see it, especially on, on, on slides. And this is a very powerful idea. We have several libraries to do it. We come to them. But it gives us full control, right? I can say with the V table, what, what do we want to have? What do we, do we have for requirements to some type? I can say I take everything up to a size or to the type ratio as wanted. So I fully control uh, that the small buffer optimization uh, as wanted. I fully control, go, do I go to the heap or not, whatever. We will see this in a moment. But of course, it is some work to implement uh, the base class. But it's less work than you might think. So, so I want to store everything that fulfills an idea, a concept. This should be drawable, right? And I don't want the ugliest compiler messages in the world where somewhere, hey, I want to call there a draw method of some point, void pointer you gave me, and it's, it's 500 lines down. So we want to, to, to have this a little bit earlier already. And this is where concept will go in future. So what we want to have is, is, is check this a little bit and give better feedback to users. And we do this with type traits today. And what's not in type traits in the standard library, we need to do our own. So this is for our, what we want to put in a scene and make it up, right? You say it's copy constructible, it's move constructible. So we want value semantic, copy, assignable, move, whatever. Drawable in a position, right? How do I express this? SDT doesn't know about this, so we could have some, some other move method, a quack. Some library implementers in meow. So, OK, that's it. Um, We take, this is, we have a template, and we overload it, right? So we take just one argument. We say the default argument is a void type, and when the compiler comes to the, the default case, we inherit from std fails type, right? And here, we take this, and if the compiler can plug in this type here as an instantiation, so this is a little bit, um, this requires also default constructible, but, but we say if, if we can call draw on a position, then the compiler will choose this one 
and we inherit from true type. And this is where, it, if the compiler cannot substitute this, it will go to this. This is where we have this substitution. It's not an error. Mm -hmm. And we have a whole presentation on our YouTube channel about this from Shaw. Very good. And this was very complex before we had true type field type and so on. And it's actually it's not that hard to write anymore to, to, to get any to, to, to when you see it, right? We have also this 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 white type. Yeah, well, what is that? This is exactly. This comes from the standard library. It's exactly. There's a, a plug in here, something, and then it will go away if it's not. Otherwise, it's a white type, and it's a type. Right. So it's exactly made for for this case. So there are for sure other methods. This is just a simple method I came up now. To, to make. So if, if the template parameter there fails with Espina and then the void type of Ah, oh, precisely. So the, the compiler says, well, I cannot plug it in here, right? And it will fall back to this one. And we need to look at the usage, actually, here. So I say, is drawable a circle? So the circle will find its way into here. Works. It's drawable box. So we get the value which is in this type. It's nice. But uh, the string is not well durable because the compiler will try to plug it in and then it goes here. And then we have a first step and at compile time it says fails. Hmm? And this is, this is, it's for sure not, not done for everyone and, and, but it's also not that magic anymore like it has have been before C11 where you need much more code to express such an idea. So and this, this type of code becomes more easier. And in the future, after C20, I expect it even more to be easy. So we need to apply all these type of traits. And this is a little bit more uh, mind-blowing. <laughs> Sorry for this, but this is like we have it. As I said, we have type traits. We take several templates. And this is what I have here, a very strict list of templates template parameters. Mm -hmm. Because everything what I take from type traits and what I have written self is a template, right? So I take all this. It's just syntax, actually. right? And here we have the, first we have seen this junction, now we have conjunction. Here is all of these I apply to the given type need to be true. And so I can say you need to be copy constructible assignment, that if I construct it, maybe, and destroyable. And I can ex express an idea. And with defining my traits list, and I call it whatever. And then I just validate the stuff. And I can produce human readable error messages, which are not totally scare people away, because otherwise people will say, oh, I don't use this word. Hmm? Mm. So this is for sure a little bit of more expert stuff, but we come from the simple. I wanted to have something for everyone. So this is pretty. You express a concept, what you want to have, where you throw away the actual type information, but you need, you need to fulfill something. You validate and you produce the readable error messages. Mm -hmm. um, I have put everything together in an example, and now we read through this code. It's not that much, but it's a little bit much, but maybe then this will help, and we go to questions after this, okay? Because if you see the whole thing in one. It should be. Okay. Contour plus, where is plus in the Swedish? Yes. Is this big enough to be? Either is this already too big? 
OK, is this big enough? Do you see this in the back, or shall I go one bigger? Good? A little, little bit bigger, OK. OK. Is this good? Excellent. So OK, this is exactly the code I've talked about now, right? So it, I, I need to have, I to have the position, because I expect a uh, uh, draw position. So I need to, to be able to forward to this. So then I, I come to my is drawable function here and here. So for this position, I need to forward it here. So this is the, the fails we have seen before on the slide. This is the true. I take my uh, trace list, the validate function and I express here my idea. OK, so this is what we have seen. So the storage. So I define 16 bytes because I use a vector, and the vector is over. If I would use 24, it would fit in the small buffer optimization. So. Here I say 16 byte. If you're bigger than 16, you go to the heap. But I can do whatever I want, right? So here is my my, my storage, which either holds a pointer or the buffer. And the buffer is on the stack, though. Yes, exactly. So here it's, uh, it's actually it goes down to a jar array, uh, unsigned jar. Yes, the part in the future. Oops, we should turn off the touch. OK, and our flag if we use the heap, right? Then I have my read table, right? where I say I want to be drawable in a position, I need to be destroyed. I need a clone method, and I take this helper to not have a reinterpret cast later. Reinterpret cast later. <laughs> but I, actually, I said, give me what is in the storage, and it gives me a white pointer, because I cannot uh, convert this otherwise to a white pointer, in, in, and it wouldn't reinterpret cast, so I can go with the start. OK? So this is my V-table. And here is, I create the V-table for a type. And I encapsulated the if heap, which is the runtime decision in one place. It is where I create the V-table. So if we are on the heap table, the, the get function will return with the pointer. I will delete the pointer. The clone method just uses the uh, copy operator, um, copy constructor of the type. This is why I want to express it in a, in a concept to have a nice, because if this doesn't compile, it will be not that easy to decrypt for user what, what's going on. So we will we want to want to extra line. But then that, if we're on the stack, I operate on the online storage and get it to as a void, which is a brutal cast here, right? <laughs> One place. And here I take the void buffer. Here is the cleanup, which we talked before. And the clone will also be a, a stack operation. I will just have a copy constructor. Hmm? And the draw method whatever it is, we draw. We get here the, the, the correct thing from the get function. Right. I don't need to sync anymore. 
because the decision for the cat has been here, what is above it, the assignment of the video. Mm. So the public interface. Of a constructor, so I take the type. Check if we, if we use the heap. The human readable error message. Make the decision where I store it. And make to the same type the V table. This is where I can be sure that my void star casts will not do nonsense. Then I need to implement all the copy constructor, the assignment operator, the move constructor. I need to tell the other you have nothing more to destroy, so please don't call any destructors. This would not be happy for me. Same with the move assignment. Right. So I just take the storage. And, and here we have the, the clone method. But the clone gives me the new wired object with the correct table. Mm -hmm. If we have something to destroy, we destroy it. And when we call draw, I call the retable draw of whatever is in the store. I don't care anymore. And the uses with my position. I make my circle, my box, I make the scene. It becomes very easy to implement because it's already a you type everything. I add whatever I want. If you give me something I cannot draw, you will get a nice compiler error message. And if we draw it, we go our drawable stuff and we call draw. And if the scene itself wants to be drawable, we just implement the concept. So the scene is copyable, constructable, and drawable, everything. And so I can use it. Right. Scene, I add whatever. This will compile. I add the scene itself. It will be copied in. So I have a new scene. And I can draw it. Maybe when you see the code in this, it's not that it's, it takes a while to. Uh, so this was, was not that, uh, hey, I've made this not up. I, I copied this from other people, of course. And it took me also a while to, to step through this. So that's very natural. Hmm? Well, we can discuss about this in a moment. So as you see, you, you, you have some handwriting to do. You define the concept. You define your V table, your storage. You plug it together. And you have something like this, and this is very good for embedded systems. Because it can, no heap, heap allocation, and you can you give me something that is too big. Right? And you could have also have a storage instead of a vector of array. And then you know exactly how many elements are there. So very powerful. Mm -hmm. Cool. 104 slides, and how fast have I been? Pretty fast, I know. And there is an existing solution, uh, Louis Dion. It's called Dino. So if you want to, to use such a library, you can already give this a try. Um, So this is the boilerplate version of, of about what I showed you in his library. And this is the, where is it, the clear interface. And the interface is drawable, and it has a draw method. And then you fall back to macros, of course, when you want this to generate all the stuff. So there is some, some reusable logic behind of this, right? And uh, plus the works, it changed from, I think, from, from R9, from, from Amazon to this is a standard library implementer now. So maybe we will see something like this in some future. 
ready to use for us because Dino has all the storage policies already in its library. You can say, I want a storage policy of maximum this size and then go to the heap, maximum of this size and then don't compile, things like this. But uh, you have also seen it's, it's not that hard. It's a little bit, takes some time too, but it's not like you need to read so much books anymore. Right? So, sorry. But in the, now in this latest example, you, you did the whole create v table thing mm -hmm. to to uh, to call the draw function. But earlier you had an example, I think, with a placeholder oh, yeah. class, and then in that example you had a abstract class exactly uh, with the right. draw method. Exactly. Yeah. So and, this and then uh, you. Uh, you so you forced upon the objects to implement the draw mm -hmm. method. Exactly. And then you didn't need to have the V table to call that draw function or... or exactly, uh, because uh, the, the, uh, the very uh, first example there was this base class where we say it has a draw function and I had an implementation class that says give me this type and I create this type in me and when you call the, the, from the base class the draw method I will call from this type the draw method. Yeah. So you go over object-oriented programming, classical object-oriented programming, to this result. Yes, okay. right? so you use... Uh, yes, so and this is basically the history how it comes to this. So people didn't invent this and say this is the first implementation of this, right? So there's a long history which started maybe earlier than any. No, no this is the example I showed you with the placeholder and so. I have it in the references, uh, scene parent. If you look, this object oriented is the root of evil or so. It's, it's a whole series of presentations. He explains exactly the same. And with this mm, fundamental no, base knowledge I gave him, now you will be, mm, understand it much easier when you hear this the first time. And you will also understand what, what Lustion is doing here. So this is basically the, because the, the, the classic object oriented programming has, there is heap allocation, right? And there is a clone method like new something yeah. else, right? And some people don't want it. You, if you are a better developer, you don't want it, right? So if you if you do it like in your uh, first example, then you need to make a new. Or exactly, new. right. Because this is classically object-oriented programming. You have, a, you have a pointer to the base class, mm. right? And here you have, if you say, I, 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 I design my storage as a storage, which is always on the stack, and I say, okay, I do so in so many bytes of storage usage, then there is no heap allocation involved anymore. Right? Or you make this mixed stuff where you say, okay, it, it's very hard for, to bring this as a library to fulfill all user needs, right? You, an embedded, might have a total different need than someone who makes, like Simbarant, he does this for Photoshop, right? <laughs> and he applies the same concept with, with copy and write and so on, that every time you make a change, the scene copies. <laughs> it doesn't really copy, but because the copy and write is behind, right? But there is a new scene with the latest change, and then you can go back in history and so on. <coughs> so these are, these are different concepts for different use cases, and the history of how, how this developed, and this is the latest I know. This is where we come. Um, going, back to, going back to the terminology, as you said, you present this first example of classical object-oriented programming <coughs> and, and inheritance. Uh, the, the second method you, you show here with the D-table, that is what I would call delegation rather than inheritance, uh -huh. uh, to use some terminology that from, uh, what's his name, Alpina. Um, to me, it seems that if you have full control of the software, my preference is to go for classical object-oriented programming because I'm comfortable, more comfortable with it. But I see, I think I see one great advantage of your second approach based on delegation, which is that it is open-ended. That you, even if you have some large piece of uh, library, if it uses these data structures, you can add your own types without cooperation from, I mean, if you, with classical object-oriented programming, you have an interface that is defined by the space class mm -hmm. and these virtual functions. And of course, you can add new objects that use that interface. 
However, if you would like to add other interfaces, then you are stuck. If you cannot recompile the, the base library, then you are stuck. But my gut feeling is that with this approach, you can extend the interfaces yes, without collaboration from the underlying library. It doesn't say replace everything from object-oriented programming, right? It is just a different variation which you can use mm -hmm. in your daily day-to-day -day problems you have to solve, right? Classical object-oriented programming face totally on embedded devices. Mm -hmm. There is no allocation allowed. Because if you make new to somewhere, it's not deterministic anymore. Mm -hmm. So you cannot use it. And then you have to go to this because then you have, all of a sudden I have object-oriented programming with value semantic on the stack. And this is, gives me more power than for when I do my, my, my development on, on embedded stuff, right? And then you have this intermediate stuff, like I show with the concept and the placeholder of the widget, where I say, okay, I don't want to implement the whole base class. If you look to some base classes, like, uh, let's say, okay, there are 20 abstract functions you need to implement in this, in this thing. Why did they auto implement this app so I couldn't make some default implementation that does nothing? Now I need to make some stupid implementation for nothing, right? So I just say, okay, I implement just a small portion of the interface I'm interested in. So it's, it's case, it's not a either this or that. You need to define for your problem what is the best solution. Until recently we didn't have this idea. I haven't seen it, so this is a pretty new idea in, that came up. Uh, before this, it was the so the first thing was the any. Then it was uh, I've seen the parent changing the any with the widget thing, and I lose the on with 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 this. And there are others. So if you if you if you search today for for type erasure in C plus plus, you will find this stuff. But it's not to throw away everything you know and use just this. That's not uh, the case. It's just the enrichment of our toolbox, right? This this is how I. I see. So this is the the things Kevin Handler, is, I think, is the original author of Boost Any. He has some nice talks. You can listen to them. They're very good teaching stuff. Sim Barrett, he has a, he has a own uh, website now with all his presentations. Go all of them. Excellent stuff. And it takes some time. I think, as I said, Louis Dion. If you watch this talk now, which is from the latest CPPCon, CPPCon in last year and this year ACCU, you will totally understand what he's talking about. And he will explain it Dino and how it works in, in one hour, what I compressed now. So it's, uh, I gave you just the overview of, of what we have in our toolbox. Right? Hmm? Yeah, I have a question. Hmm? So would another approach to avoid uh, dynamic memory allocation, be to write your own uh, memory allocator? Sure. Yeah. Yes, you have always this, but this is also not always that trivial, because new circle, where is your allocator? <laughs> I don't use it, right? It's not there. Yeah. 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 Think how the memory yeah, so, but of course this is something people do. Also, right? There is whole allocator library, blah blah blah. Hours. Yeah. It's a very complex topic. Yeah. Well, that's how you did, right? Mm -hmm. But we use we use classical. Uh, we're referring to my last presentation. Yeah. Um, but we use classical object-oriented programming throughout. Uh, exactly. But we use memory. We use custom memory allocations. Yeah just for performance reasons, mm -hmm. not for semantic reasons. I mean, these things are applied with the with allocator, there are own allocator libraries and so on, and a lot of discussions also about this, what are the practice. And you can make also a stack allocator. Yeah, exactly. Yes. So, so then it looks like it's, yeah, you're it, using inheritance, but it's stack. Exactly, yes. It's just another tool in the toolbox. So we use C++, we have an unbelievable rich toolbox. Mm -hmm. The factor is we need some invest some time to learn all this stuff, right? So this is really other languages. Hey, here's, here's the one thing you can do, right? Like people are absolutely happy. So we, we have an open universe. People always detect new stuff and come up with new techniques like this type of ratio. Mm -hmm. Mix-ins become maybe other stuff. 
So. I have a question. Uh, since we're very into the latest update, is, is lots of new techniques going towards this uh, concepts type ratio part that, that as Dog mentioned, you, it's easier to extend. I, I know that Dog Abraham from the Boost Library is one of the main writers of Swift, mm. where they use protocol oriented programming instead of, of mm. object oriented. Is that the, the movement we're seeing in C? Also? I don't think that there is a movement. There are hypes in C, right? Someone detects something, well, you can do this, and all of a sudden everyone talks about it, right? And in three years or in three months, we will have a new something. And be, oh, this, yes, of course, I use it also in this place. At first, we all overuse stuff because we need to get, we need to learn stuff. And we use this, oh, there's this new thing, I use it everywhere, right? And after some while, it turns out, okay, it's not so good here, it's not so good here. And you get your routines where to use things. So, and type erasure was, was a topic for some time, for sure. And this is still because it's, there is no, but as, as I've also explained, there are so many variations of it. It's not to make an easy library for, hey, here's your, here's your library. On the other hand, it's not that hard to implement that also. So. But C++ has an obligation to support a certain number of PhDs in computer science. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say expert friendly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but uh, I think it will become easier. What we will for sure have is, is this generic program with concepts. That template programming will be much easier. If you compare this, co if, if const expression, for example, where you can make compile time decisions, it reads like normal code. Mm -hmm. And we, this will be for sure a shift because people are working very hard to, to, to make this more accessible. Also, this FINA type I've showed, it was much harder to write with C11, uh, pre C11. You mm -hmm. could do it and you could, can look at Boost. There are several implementations. There's also a type erasure library in Boost. Where you say, okay, I, I, I'm, I'm built around any, but give me something, and it uses boost meta programming template library with, with concept type trips to, to describe a concept. And, yeah. But for a number of years, surely 15 years, there are two camps in the C standards committee. There is, well, broadly speaking, there is one group that wants to extend the language to it becomes more powerful for sophisticated programmers, library builders. Mm. And there is another kind of people that wants to keep the language with me. <coughs> Extend the language in such a way that it's easier to use for end users, mm. for human programmers. And I think this is a good thing because they, they need to have some, there is this not 51 uh, voices against 49. They always when these new things come to C++, there need to be a large agreement what is. So these two camps need to find some agreement for new things. And this is why some things take a so long time to come to the standard. <laughs> so I think this actually is a good thing that we have these two, two groups in the, in the things because they want to drive it and the others, oh, not so fast, right? And we have a very good balance that we put things to the standard and then always find out, wow, there was a mistake and so But uh, C++ becomes definitely easier. And I think after C++ 20 with concept and so on, it will become again easier where they say, when we, when we start to learn, okay, what does this concept they will give us out of the box mean? And I see a function signature where I say, I work with everything that fulfills this concept. So this will, this will help a lot. Of course, we need to learn how to deal with this word. Hmm? Nice, uh, this is where you can reach me. Twitter, Meetup, and, and LinkedIn. And questions? We can, if people want to stand up now, <laughs> can stand up, and, and those want, I will hang around a little bit for further discussion if wanted. So thanks for listening. Thank you all.